morning. Are you ready? Ready, ready, ready. Eager. Um, happy Father's Day. It's, um, it's a privilege to be able to talk to you today on this day. And uh, hopefully I will be able to um, bring a few things in that are pertinent to fathers. And um, it is important about fathers. And David um, was a father of many children. And uh, we can see from David some of the things what's really quite, I think, powerful about the biblical narrative is the way that it's so honest. Um, it shows Davis to be a flawed man and yet in the midst of all that it shows his heart and shows how God can use a flawed man uh, that as long as that man is wanting to uh, pursue the things of God and so even when we blow it God can use us and um, the, the Bible says that David was a man after his own heart and that he served the purposes of God in his generation. So um, it, it is a powerful thing to look at the life of David and uh, there is so much more packed into the life of David than I've certainly brought out. Um, but it is, it is wonderful. And so as uh, Faith said, today is uh, the finale of this series on David. And... Um, uh, thinking about Father's Day, um, I got a card from my um, second born, and um, Faith, I'll, I'll do it just to, she, she sent me this card, and on the front of the card it says, if at first you don't succeed, try again, with love from your second born. <laughs> So faith went, that's a dig at me. <laughs> um, so it's that. First week we looked at Goliath and David's um, faith, tremendous faith and courage and uh, how God used him and he became a national hero and uh, just really was obviously one of the, the massive things that David's known for. Um, then the second week we looked at how crazy uh, King Saul was in pursuing after David and how David ultimately tried to do things his way. He was on the run. Uh, he was a fugitive. He, he was, um, you know, had no one really to, uh, to, to go to. Uh, whether he was in his own land, he was on the run and he couldn't go to the, the surrounding nations who um, they, they were enemies but the key we learned from that week was that it's best not to take things into your own hands and to do things your way. And we know that from that, that actually many people died. Uh, the priests, I think it was about 70 priests died, plus uh, the whole uh, of their households and their villages died as well. And then last week, we looked at how David was uh, on his way to, uh, to reap vengeance Again, he was going to do things his way, but a woman saved the day. And uh, so we heard all about Abigail, and she was a phenomenal woman who had a tremendous perspective and great humility and was able to save David from making a, another stupid mistake. Uh, one of the things you learn about David is, is he made a lot of stupid mistakes. And today we will learn that he did other mistakes as well. Now, in week two, we particularly looked that, um, that, that, that his problems came because of someone else. It was King Saul that actually stopped the dream that David had or the dream that God had given him, the promises that God had given him to be king. Um, Saul was the one that was in the way. But this week we'll see that actually... David was the problem, and his problems came because of his actions, not because of the actions of someone else. And so, it's, it, it, I don't know about for you, but for, for, for us in life, it's usually not long, but sometimes it's certainly 
later in life, you realize that there are a lot of dreams and certainly some significant dreams in your life that cannot come to pass. For example, a dream of playing for Leeds United. <laughs> that was Adam's dream, of course. <laughs> plans are great, and I, I say everybody should have plans, yes? Um, it is important to have goals in life. It's important to do to, to things. But often reality, always reality, can often trump the goals and the dreams that we have. It gets to a stage in life where we realize some of the dreams that we had can no longer happen. And I want to speak into that a little bit today. <clears throat> now, sometimes our dreams don't happen because of other people. Like we saw with David with King Saul. But sometimes our dreams fail because of the things that we do that stop them happening. And so it is a fact of life that some dreams will not come to pass, will not come true. And that's the things that devastate us. So the things that cannot come true, for example, sometimes it's you will not live happily ever after. You might not ever get to walk your daughter down the aisle. It may be that you will never need a high chair. Maybe you will never be able to have children. It may be that your prodigal will not return home. It may be that you will not get into that school or that university. It may be that he will marry her anyway. Maybe that money will always be tight. It wasn't that dream job after all. And it may be that your family will never ever have that holiday that you once dreamt of having. It may be that you won't see your grandchildren. It may be that new business that you're venturing that will not take off. It may be that your parents will not get back together. It could be that your son is not going to take over the family business. It may be that you will never get married. The list goes on of dreams that can not come to pass so often in our lives because of some of the things that happen in our life because of either things other people have done or because of things that we have done. Now, so often we're under the impression, and I have been uh, too, as well as everybody else, that it's a case of, well, I felt God had promised I felt that it was something that was due, something that I was entitled to. Yes, in other words, you played by the rules and it still didn't happen. And it didn't matter what you did, it didn't come to pass. It seems as if God's answering other people's prayers, but not your prayers. It seems as if God's giving them your dream and not you. And so that is one of the difficulties that we face. So the question is, what do we do when our dreams don't come true? Well, this is where we come into the life of David. David, in his 20s, God, he dreams of what God will do. And of course, it's undermined by King Saul. And so he goes on a run into the wilderness, as we saw, becomes a fugitive. And he did what many of us do. He panicked. And he took things into his own hands and tried to do things his way. But now we're going to look at him as king. He's now, as it were, the dreams come to pass. He is, he is the king. But he's going to undermine his own dreams. And so where he learned an important lesson, um, when, when he took matters into his own hands, today we learn that he learned another important lesson when he undermined his own uh, his own dream. We, we join the story 22 years after he has become king. He's in his 50s. Now, 50 in those days was ancient. Yes, it was like the ancient of days. Yes. So, in other words, he was no longer the cool guy on the block. He'd probably lost most of his teeth, was probably smelly, and, uh, and he was just not going to be what he used to be. His strength would fail, 
um, and he would not be that kind of warrior that he was uh, when he was a young man. And so we join the story where David is sending his army out to war. It says at the time when kings go to war. So David sends his, his army out, but he stays home. We don't know why he stayed home. We don't know. He doesn't give the reasons for that. But we do know that when he stayed home, it became a problem for him because he stayed home. One of the things that I want to talk about today as a kind of uh, an add-on into this is that David was clearly passive at this stage in his life. Now, David normally was anything but passive. He was active, he was proactive, he was, a, he was a warrior, he loved to do this. But when he becomes king, it seems as if he takes his foot off the pedal and he allows things to go. Now, maybe because of ruling the kingdom, his leadership had to change from being a fighter to being uh, a governor and uh, making rules and, and organizing things and managing rather than being a leader and initiating things. We don't fully know but one of the things that we read about David generally is that he is not passive. But what we do see in his story that he was obviously passive with his children. And this causes him no end of problems. Now, David stays home. And as he's on the rooftop, well, if you know anything about the area, all the houses have flat roofs. So it wasn't something that was, uh, was different. It's not like where I live and uh, you have a house with a flat roof, it's kind of like, why would you be walking or bathing as Bathsheba was on the, on the roof? It was, in our culture, it's out, it just seems very strange. But in their culture, it was often the norm. It's obviously, it's warm there rather than, <laughs> it's usually cold and windy and wet here. And so he sees Bathsheba bathing and he takes a liking to her. And so he says to his servants, who is that? And they say who she is. She's Uriah's wife. And he says, send for her. Now, if you remember going back, um, the people of Israel were warned about having a king. They were told this is the kind of thing that will happen when you have a king. Because when you have a king, he makes demands. He expects certain things. And as in this case, you don't say no to a king. And so it, 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 it was a case of they sent for Bathsheba. Bathsheba came to him and he slept with Bathsheba. It probably was more than maybe one night. But she's at home and she sends word to David to say that she is pregnant. And as a result of that, David panics. And he does what he's been doing, which is so often to take matters into his own hands. So what he does is he sends for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, one of the, uh, we think, commanders in the army. And he comes home and he asks for a report. David kind of pretends nothing's going on unusual and he says to Uriah, he says, oh, how's things going in the battle? And Uriah says, oh, things are going well, and this, that, and other. And so he says, off you go. You go home and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and spend the night at home. Uh, you deserve it. You've done well. But Uriah doesn't do what David thinks he would do. Uriah goes to the very gates of the palace, and he stays the night with the servants in the palace. And so David hears about this. And so the next day he sends for Uriah and says, what happened to that? Why did you not go home to your wife? Because he's hoping that he will go home to his wife and he will go to bed with his wife and so the child would be seen as Uriah's and not David's. He's hoping that this cover-up will work. He's trying to plot and scheme. But Uriah's having none of this, even though he knows nothing about this. He's a good and honorable guy. And he says, how can I go home uh, to be with my wife when my, my companions, my friends, uh, my fellow countrymen are out in the fields, sleeping out in the fields. They're in the tents. How can I go home and be like that? So he says, okay. So he, he invites Uriah and he gets Uriah drunk 
and, uh, and sends him home again, tries again the next night, but again Uriah, even though he's drunk, does the same thing, stays at the palace gate. So David decides, well, okay, there's, there's another option to this if you're not going to play ball. And so he sends a message to Joab in the very hands of Uriah. He says to Uriah, go with this letter and go to Joab And Joab reads the letter, and the letter says, put Uriah on the very front of the battlefield, and when you put him there, then withdraw from him. In other words, it was a death sentence, and Uriah dies uh, in the midst of battle. So David thinks, okay, now I've got rid of him, and so what he does do is he marries Bathsheba, like you do. And so he marries her and thinks her, okay, she's pregnant, she has the child, but things are not, not right. And so what happens is God speaks to a prophet called Nathan. And Nathan comes along and he speaks uh, to, to um, David and tells him a fictitious story. Now, this isn't the first time that David has a fictitious story told to him. Maybe it's something he loves stories, but he gets into the story that Nathan's telling him, and he starts to get angry, and he's got, and he's saying, who's that guy? And he's getting angry, and then Nathan, of course, gives the punchline, and he goes, you are that guy. You're the man that you're getting angry. You are the one who has taken what was not yours. And so David responds in a good way. He responds with repentance. He's, he realizes that he's done wrong. And so he responds. He is, uh, he's a broken man and he's allowed the word of God to break him. He's not trying to, although he's broken God's law, he allows God's law to break him. And so he has a good attitude to that. And that's so important. The key is to realize that all sin has consequences. That's a takeaway for all of us to know is that all sin has consequences even if you are a king. In other words, sin comes prepackaged with consequences. It's integral to it. There are penalties to our sin. And I don't mean Football penalties, okay? Uh, not like the Gareth Bale who missed a penalty, we might add. But uh, so Nathan says this to him. This is what we, this is key to us. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, he said, This is what the Lord says Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. But David's response is honest, it's humble, and um, I believe it's one that we should emulate in his thing. This is how he, how he responds in verse 13. He says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This is an important one, I feel, for us to understand because we would often naturally think he'd sinned against Bathsheba. But actually, he'd sinned against the Lord because God determined the law. He determines what's right and what's wrong. So he had broken God's law. And Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are forgiven. You are not going to die. The thing was, is David, although he was the king of Israel, recognized that he was not the king. He was a king, but he was not the king. And he recognized who ruled and reigned, and it's so important to us. Now, so David acknowledges his fault, and he surrenders to God's will. Now, a year goes by, nothing happens. Two years go by, nothing happens. Five years go by, nothing happens. Ten years go by, nothing has happened. Until his firstborn son, Amnon, enters into the plot line of the narrative uh, in Samuel. And Amnon has got the hots for his half-sister Tamar. 
And he is lusting after her, he desires her, he thinks about her night and day, and so he's lovesick, and so, you know, Tamar just ignores him, she's oblivious to him, she's kind of, he's just one of the other sons, and so she's not really thought, he's a half-brother, she's not given him any kind of uh, attention at all, and so he, he decides to take matters into his own hands. And so what he does is he throws a party, he invites King David, he invites his dad to the party, but his dad says, oh no, no that's no good for, good for me, but you, you know, you go have a great time. And so, um, so Amnon um, decides that what he's going to do is pretend to be ill, pretend to be sick. And so that's what he does. And uh, he specifically asks his dad and says, can I... Um, can I have Tamar to come and to look after me? And so it's all his plot. And so he ends up being on his own with Tamar and, uh, and makes advances to her. And she uh, wants nothing to do with it. So although uh, he attempts to seduce her, she resists. And in, verse, in chapter 13, verses 12 and 15, it says this. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than her, he raped her. And then listen to this next verse, which is gut-wrenching. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. She's devastated. She has nowhere to go. She'll never, in her culture, she'll never be married. Um, her life is ruined forever. However, there are no secrets in the palace. And David finds out and he's furious. But the problem is, he does nothing about it. He acts in a passive way. We don't know why he didn't do anything. It may be that he felt that he didn't have the moral authority because of his time with Bathsheba. But whatever it was, he doesn't act as a father should have acted in this way. You see, doing nothing only leads to making matters worse. You see, you don't need to be perfect to correct people, particularly your children. We need fathers who will bring order and discipline with grace and love to our children. You see, discipline done right is love in action. Discipline is not cruelty. It's not pain without reason. But we need boundaries in our life and our children need to learn those boundaries. They are so important to them. And the father's role is to set those boundaries. So my cry to fathers is, don't be passive. A passive dad sees a need, sees a problem, and does not address it. He doesn't do what's needed. He, you know, he gives in, or he goes along with whatever it is, and that becomes his default mode. He's abdicated his role as a father, and I know that for, for, for many of us, we are, have not had some good role models of fathers, and so it's important for us to be good role models to, to others. And particularly if you've got sons, to be a role model for how our sons should respond uh, in, in our world and in family life. And so we've got to help people to do that. Now, there are two particularly big areas for fathers that, that so often we get wrong. And we are passive in two big areas. The first one is discipline. Discipline our children. We abdicate that so often. And the second one comes in protecting. Now, protecting is more than just physically protecting them, but that is important and it's paramount. But also protecting them in their relationships and in social media and various other aspects to protect their minds, to protect them and to give them 
boundaries, yes? So, for example, if they, as they grow up and your, ch- your, your daughters uh, are going to maybe have uh, boyfriends at some point, at whatever point you allow that, is for you to be in, the father is there to be the protector, yes? And uh, for many of you maybe heard the, uh, the application form for being a boyfriend of one of my daughters, <laughs> Um, which just made it that it's impossible to date them. Um, But we can be so often, we can be passive, and particularly we can be passive with discipline, and David was passive with discipline. And so the problem is so often is, uh, as fathers, we don't know how to discipline. Now, I know there's different views. Uh, Some uh, are, are, uh, are all for spanking their child, and for others they think it's just more kind of maybe time out or whatever. The thing for me... Is it's not uh, the, the how, but as long as it happens. There has to be some form of discipline happening. Now, for me, I personally favor um, dog uh, behavioral collars. <laughs> have you seen them where they have the dog has the collar around and they, when it goes somewhere where it shouldn't do, you just press the button and it goes... <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. That's just a joke. But, um, but, uh, but I think one of the things, the problems with dads is they want to be loved, they want to be liked, and too many dads are trying to be their friends with their children. They, your call and your role as a dad is to be their protector and to, to set the guidelines, to set the rules, and to, and to be one who will guide them through life so that they can grow up and understand how life should be lived and and how it should be. But unfortunately, too many dads struggle with this. They struggle because they think to myself, I, I do, you know, will, the, will my, my children like me if I'm, if I'm tough? I want to say to you that if you're tough with your children, and I don't mean abuse, I don't mean being over the top, I'm on about doing it in a loving way, in a, in, a, in a correct way, but being firm so that when they push against the boundaries, and all children will, because whatever boundary you set, they will push against it. Yes, it's the human nature. Uh, you've, got to, you, you've got to be able to be the enforcer of that. And that's what dad's role is, not to leave it to mum, and if mum does enforce things, then dad needs to back that up. And so that's the way it should work. Now, children will do that. Now, sometimes they can be belligerent, uh, they can t- say no to your face, and you have got to have some form of punishment so that they will not do that again. It's got to be some kind of deterrent that will put the children off doing that, yes? Now, they, that, that can take all sorts of forms. It could be that they give you one of them looks and roll their eyes. It could be something that they slam the door or storm out or whatever, anything. As fathers, discipline is so important. And so um, we've got to see that the problem was David was passive with his discipline. And in whatever we don't know, but he had problems with his sons because of a lack of discipline. And so onto the scene comes Absalom. And so Absalom is David's son number three. We don't know what happened to son number two. We think he died by this, this stage. So we've got son number one and son number three. Yes, Amnon was son number one. He was the eldest and Absalom's number three, but he's the favorite. Okay. He might be third, but he's the favorite. Yes. And, uh, and we think that, um, that after um, Amnon, he would be next in line uh, to be king. So Absalom is Tamar's brother. This is important. So Amnon was Tamar's brother, but only a half-brother. Same dad, different mum. Absalom, he's got the same dad and the same mum. They are, you know, brothers and sisters in this. And so Absalom uh, hears about uh, the problem uh, with Amnon and that he's raped his sister. And so he takes her into his home and looks after her now that she is destitute. But Absalom does nothing. He just, one year goes by, nothing. Two years go by, and then Absalom, we find, has got a plan. He's scheming on a plan. He's shrewd. Because he waits 
until he thinks everybody's forgotten about it and he throws a big, um, a big party. And so when he throws his party, he invites all his, so, all his brothers and all the brothers come, including Amnon, and he gets Amnon drunk and then he gets his men to kill Amnon because of what he did to his sister uh, Tamar. And we find that again, that well, um, um, Absalom goes on the run, goes to what we would probably call Syria now, and, uh, and so he's on the run, and all the other brothers, they scarper for it because they don't want to get murdered. Um, but what we find is David hears about it, but guess what he does? Nothing. I hope you're getting a theme here. <laughs> yes, he does nothing. His oldest son has been murdered by his favorite son. Now, after three years, David invites Absalom back to Jerusalem. He's missing him, so he invites him back to Jerusalem. But he never asks for Absalom to come. So although he's in the same city, it's like he's saying, you're forgiven, but I don't want to see you. And so Absalom gets upset about this. And after a few years, eventually, he thinks, how can I get my dad's attention? So what he does is, Joab, who is the chief commander of the army, he's David's right-hand man, he burns Joab's farm down. He sets fire to, to his land. And so Joab comes to Absalom and says, what's this? What's going on? And Absalom goes, well, at last I've got your attention. And so he says to Joab, he says, David has never asked for me. I want you to talk to David for me. Uh, so that I can get to see David. And so Joab, like a good old warrior, he sends a woman ahead. And he sends this woman in, and she tells a fictitious story again, and David's taken in, and he goes, who is this guy? And of course she says, you're the guy. And so he's, uh, he, he realized what he's done, so he asks for Absalom. He sends for Absalom and uh, he basically puts his hands on Absalom, not like that, but, you know, uh, and the, the old symbolism was is that you're forgiven. But actually, David never, ever asks to see Absalom again. So although David had, in one way, said he'd forgiven him, his actions over the long term caused a rift and caused a problem for Absalom. And as dads, it's so important that we take the lead in our relationships with our children. That they understand that we love them, that we want to protect them, that we've got the best for them, and even when they blow it, we want the best for them. Amen? And so that is important for us. And so, uh, so this is what happens. So the problem is, of course, is that, uh, that Absalom is now back to his scheming. Yes? He's back now to, um, to thinking, well, how can I get... Uh, things sorted. So he's very wise. Uh, he's a handsome guy. Um, he's an intelligent guy. And, uh, and so he sits at the gates. In those days, if you sat in the gates, you were kind of the ones to go to for advice. And so he actually, it says, he won the hearts of the people. He said, well, if I was king, this is what I would do. If I was king, this is what I would do in that situation. And so he won people, because people are thinking, oh, wouldn't it be good if Absalom was king? And so over the long haul, that's what, uh, what he does. He, he, uh, he um, changes that. And in verse, um, <clears throat> where are we? Uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 15 and verse 10. It says, Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Now you've got to remember that in those days they didn't have Facebook and Instagram and all these kind of things, didn't have email, whatever. They just had someone coming along and announcing it. So as far as they're concerned, it's been announced that Absalom is king. They don't know what's happened to David. Has he abdicated? Has he died? Or whatever, we don't know. But off he goes. And, uh, and so it's like Absalom has made, been made king. And of course, David hears about this. And, uh, and so we've got to remember that this is 16 years after his, his escapade with Bathsheba. So in other words, things don't unravel overnight, but they do unravel at, at some point. And so here David is um, with Absalom coming uh, for him. 
verse 13 says, A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. Absalom is in charge of the majority. He's got the army, he's got the kind of main people. David is quite weak in this situation. But what's interesting is David abandons the throne and he leaves the city so that he can save the inhabitants of the city. He's not doing it for his sake. He's going, if I put a fight up here, many people are going to get killed as a result of this. So he sets off out with his family, with all his friends, with all the people that are going to go, and they file out of Jerusalem in order that the, the city itself would be spared. He's a fugitive again. He's probably about 61 years of age, and the dream is falling apart again. And so often for us, that's where our life intersects with the story of David. Yes, is that we're heartbroken, we get disappointed, we get angry, we get frustrated, and we're often sometimes maybe looking for someone to blame, and we're asking, where is God in this? What's the point? Why even try? You know, you hung in there with him and see how things worked out. You waited for what? Yeah, you raised them right, and look how they've turned out. You were honest, you worked hard, and see how that worked out for us. You might be thinking, I don't deserve to be treated that way. You were told, if you were honest, that these certain things wouldn't happen. And so what happens is we do take things into our own hands and we make matters worse. And we have more hurt and more pain as a result of this. So David is not the first time that he's been on the run, as we know. And so he's on the run again this time. And uh, he's fled it. But this time... Whereas in the first time he took matters into his own hands, this time he doesn't do that. Yes? And so, um, <clears throat> it's verse 23 of uh, Samuel 15 says, The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on towards the wilderness. Zadok the high priest was there too. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now remember, the Ark of the Covenant of God represented the presence of God. It was like if you took the Ark of God with you into battle, if you took the Ark of God with you, it was like was God was on your side. Now this is what's fasc fascinating, is to David, although the Ark's coming with him, and the priest is going, and the many priests are going with him, David feels that this is manipulating God in some way or other. And so he says to Zadok the high priest, he says, take the Ark of God back into the city. Hey, now, this is where you see the difference between age and perspective on David's life, where he says this, If I find favour in the Lord's eyes, he will mean me back again and let me see it and his dwelling place again. In other words, David's saying, not my will, but your will. David had lost his world, but he still hadn't lost his confidence in God. He understood this. He chose not to abandon God, even though it looked like God had abandoned him. And so here he is, not wanting to put the, uh, the city of Jerusalem at risk. He's not wanting to, to put up a fight against his son Absalom. He's saying, it's not about me, but I want God's will in this. And so that's the powerful thing of verse 26. But he says... He says, I am not, if God says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. Every time he does a plan, David, he messes it up. When he does it his way, it ends up getting in the way. And so this is, I think, is a powerful lesson for all of us, is to realize we must live our life, not my will, but your will be done. This is so important for us. Well, another character comes on the scene. This is Ahithophel. Now, Ahithophel was uh, David's chief advisor. Uh, he was a really powerful advisor, one of David's trusted advisors. <coughs> 
But what happens is he deserts David. He stays in the, in the city. Uh, he changes de- sides. He defects to Absalom and thinks, right, uh, Absalom's going to be king. I want to be in with Absalom. And so Ahithophel advised two things to Absalom. The first thing he advised was to go and sleep with David's concubines, of which he did. The second thing that he advised uh, was for him to take straight away Absalom, go with 12,000 men, chase David now, kill David only, and everybody else will come and follow you. It was good advice. It would have been. But David anticipated that Ahithophel would give good advice. And so he asked another of his trusted advisors who had gone with him out of Jerusalem, who was faithful to David, to go back to frustrate the advice of Ahithophel. And this is what Hushai says to him, yes? He says, Hushai replied to Absalom, the advice Ahithophel has given is not good this time. You know your father and his men, they are fighters and as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Now we might use that in, in, a, in, in, a, in a general way, but actually these guys knew what a bear with robbed of, <laughs> of cubs looked like, yeah? And they didn't want to go. They says, besides your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now he is hidden in a cave or some other place. If he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say, there has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom. Then even the bravest soldier whose heart is like the heart of a lion will melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a fighter and that those with him are brave. So he advises Absalom and Absalom and the other leaders around him think, yeah, this is even better advice than Ahithophel. And Ahithophel realizes that his advice hasn't been taken. And so he realizes that the battle has been lost because he knows that you give David time. He's a brilliant uh, tactician on the the battlefield. He will not be beaten in, in battle once he's got time to prepare himself. So he realizes time's up for him. And so he goes home and hangs himself like you do now don't tell me that the Bible is boring yes this is an exciting thing this is uh, you know the ex- most exciting thing that you will you will read isn't it the narrative that they will make films about but David hears that Absalom is coming now David is wise and so he splits his army the guys that have gone with him into three he has three commanders over three units and, uh, and so he goes. Now, one of the things, as he's, uh, the, the commanders persuade David and say, you stay home because if you go and you get killed, we've lost. So what we want you to do is we want you to stay in this city. Uh, there was a different city. Stay in that city and we will go out. And so David's um, kind of stood at the entrance to the, to the city and he's watching the men going out and saying, fight well in that law. And all the men hear David talk to the commanders And he says this uh, in verse 5 of chapter 18. He says, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. Yes, now... This, everybody's heard this, so they know that David wants, even though they're going to battle against Abs- Absalom, David loves his son and he doesn't want any harm to come to him. But what happens is they fight in the forest of Ephraim. And, uh, and it says there that uh, uh, the, there Israel's troops were routed by David's men and the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men died of Israel. The battle spread out over the whole countryside and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Yes. Now, if you're George, you're probably thinking of Treebeard and the Ents of the Lord of the Rings. But I don't think it's quite like that. It's certainly it's bogs and it's low branches and it's, you know, it's that kind of things that stop them being able to, to make much progress. But this is David's fighting field. He understands the terrain and so they do. And so they, they win uh, the day. And Absalom is caught. He actually says he was caught on a low branch and he's there. He had phenomenal air. And he's caught by his air and he can't go one way or the other. And his kind of his, his mule, his horse, whatever he's on, uh, disappears. And he's left hanging. And so the soldiers see this. And one of them goes to Joab and says, Oh, Absalom is hanging. And Job goes, Man, say, Why didn't you kill him? 
And the guy says to me, he says, well, of course, if I kill him, I says, you'll disown me. And, um, uh, you know, and so he offered him money. And uh, he said to me, you could offer me 10 million times that kind of amount. And I'm still not going to do it. So Joab went with three spears and he put them through Absalom's heart. And then the men round killed him. So in other words, even though David had been explicit in his instructions, Joab made sure that Absalom died as a result of this and this caused when David heard about this even though they had won the victory the sorrow that David felt was overwhelming and it was so overwhelming that the men around him that had had victory that day were scared to celebrate and Joab goes to David and he says to him he says it's about time you man up it's about time you got your act together because these men are scared to celebrate when God has given us a victory today and so he does and uh, and so David goes back to Jerusalem he's king again but you know it wasn't long before David died it was it was 70 years of age when he died it was only about seven years later he died I'm sure of a broken heart we need to understand that even when uh, happily ever afters do not happen when the dreams that we have that do not happen that it's a mistake for us to to uh, to wrap our faith uh, in in a God who we only serve when he answers prayer when he gives us the dreams we've got to be a people who say not my will but your will be because when our dreams don't come to pass it doesn't reflect on the faithfulness of God God is a faithful God and just because things don't pan out how we want them to do we need to understand this in us and so 2 Samuel 15 if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord he will bring me back let him do to me whatever seems good to him your will not my will today will you say to God like Job said even though he slay me yet will I serve him God is worth serving whatever your circumstances whatever the situation he's worth it today and I pray that you will really take hold of this lesson today and understand in the dark times of life when things are going pear-shaped that God can be trusted and that he is worth uh, putting your life in his hands and saying Lord your will not my will